Railway Association of Canada and CN Railway. We will hear each presentation, which will then be followed by questions by the commissioners to all participants. We will begin with the presentation by Railway Association of Canada. Please introduce yourself and your colleagues, and you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you, Madam Hearing Secretary. Monsieur le Président, Madame la Vice-Présidente, uh, Conseiller distingué, personnel du Conseil, uh, et collègue de l'Institut de l'Éducation. Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Brazo, and I am the President and CEO of the Railway Association of Canada. And before I start, I'd like to introduce uh, the other members of the panel. And to my left is Tannis Peterson, our Senior Director of Operations and Regulations. And to my right is Daniel Lafreniere, our Director of Spectrum and Telecommunications. And behind Daniel is uh, Bram Abramson, our Outside uh, Regulatory Affairs uh, Consultant. C'est un honneur de comparaître devant vous ce matin sur ce panel conjoint avec nos collègues du Canadien National, qui s'adresseront à vous immédiatement après notre présentation. Ce matin, nous vous parlons de ce que nous considérons être une occasion considérable d'améliorer l'intensité concurrentielle du secteur sans fil, et surtout d'améliorer les cas d'affaires pour desservir ceux et celles vivant en zone rurale et éloignée. Pour ce faire, nous vous demanderons de vous adresser à un manquement de nature réglementaire qui freine actuellement la capacité de nos membres d'avancer et de négocier les solutions dont ils ont besoin. Il s'agit de quelques mots des lignes directrices canadiennes relatives à l'attribution des identificateurs internationaux de stations mobiles, ou en anglais, les Canadian MZ Assignment Guidelines, qui limitent l'accès de nos membres au code du réseau mobile. On parle aussi des MNC, Mobile Network Codes. Well, it won't surprise you to hear that we're the industry association representing nearly 60 freight, intercity, commuting, commuter, and um, tourist railways in Canada. Our members move close to 88 million people and over $310 billion worth of goods each year across our country. But our members are also among Canada's biggest telecom operators and employ more than 2,100 telecom professionals to do it. That's nothing new. CN established the national broadcast network that became CBC. CN and CP together created a national network that kicked off telecom competition in this country with your historic 1979 uh, decision to mandate its interconnection with Bell Canada. Eventually, CNCP became Allstream. We are today out of the service provider business, but we continue to be extremely active in the Radio Advisory Board of Canada, which we co-founded. Co in 2000, Industry Canada awarded us the first Spectrum license to be granted to a user. Our role coordinating activity under that license has helped carry forward the intensive use, investments, and innovation in national wireless networks that is core to the safety and efficiency of our railways. Mais loin de nous l'idée de ralentir en matière d'innovation ou d'investissement. En tant que directeur Spectre Télécommunication à la CFC, je passe beaucoup plus de temps avec nos collègues de chez IZ, qui sont responsables de la gestion du Spectre, qu'avec euh, vous, euh, chers membres du CRTC. Et ce, pour la simple raison que ni notre association, ni nos membres ne sont des fournisseurs de services de télécommunication. Nous sommes des usagers et nous détenons une licence de Spectre à titre d'usager. Mais l'étendue et la qualité de notre réseau se comparent avantageusement à ceux des plus grands fournisseurs de services de télécommunications canadiens. In the past, our member networks have operated in a way that is parallel to the networks used by most Canadian consumers, uh, with a few exceptions for non-mission critical applications. But the railway communications grid is changing. So are the kinds of networks uh, that we are building. Our mission-critical applications now need higher speed and higher volume data transmission. The density of connected, fast-moving, 
wireless, always on devices we rely on is continuing to grow. We still rely principally on narrow band communications to do that. You'd be surprised at what we have been able to squeeze out of that spectrum. We keep upgrading how we use our transmission facilities. We keep pushing forward on our own orderly development of a trackside communications grid that safeguards, strengthens the key social and economic role that telecom enables us to play in all of Canada's regions, moving people and moving cargo. Those changes are moving us from parallel narrowband towards participation in an interconnected, interoperable network of broadband networks. Railways have never run without managing their own networks, assembling their own connectivity and interconnecting with other networks core to core. As critical infrastructure operators, the stakes are just too high for our sector. Um, we are committed to railways migration to broadband spectrum uh, as we feel that it will help the uh, that it will uh, sorry and at the same time we will look uh, we will help the commission deliver on some of its goal in this proceeding sorry you want to see lower barriers to competitive entry and a better business case for rural and remote wireless broadband. As, 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 uh, as the situation is, we are uh, thriving in rural and remote areas. We are talking about lowering the cost of wireless deployment by being in a position to share a radio access network with mobile network operators or public safety operators wherever it needs to be built. Whether they are a member of the big three, they are regional disruptors, or anyone else looking to partner on deployment and share costs. But here's the problem. In narrowband, we're doing just fine. In broadband, not so much. We face a barrier to interconnecting with mobile network operators core to core because interconnection is subject to a mobile network code, which we don't have right now. Uh, a mobile network code uh, by which we are identified to other network and which we can use to route traffic to each other is critical for our operation, uh, for our broadband operations. These mobile network codes or MNCs are, build, are basic building blocks of the LTE and 5G network. Without MNC access, we can't route our own traffic. It is as if rather than binding together upstream connectivity to make a very strong rope, we're hanging by a thread from a single carrier. It would mean outsourcing a core function that we need to be able to deploy, manage, fix, reconfigure, and control in order to meet railway industry standards and run our business. This is simply not possible. We can't outsource that. So we are here today to ask you for uh, a re the removal of a regulatory barrier preventing us from moving forward. I would like to be clear. This is about mobile network codes, not eSIMs. Different critical infrastructure operators design and build different telecom networks, yet lack of MNC access to our own routing is a key building block holding all of us back. The RAC's members are all on the same page. We think you'll find the Canadian Electricity Association's member R2. We do share some interest with them, and you will be hearing from them next week. We're asking that you direct the Canadian Steering Committee on Numbering to revise the Canadian IMSI assignment guidelines to enable critical infrastructure operators to access mobile network codes so that we can migrate our mission-critical communications to broadband. This wouldn't be the first time the Commission has done exactly that. In your 2015-177 wireless regulatory framework, you took care at paragraphs 161 and 162 to direct the CICS numbering committee to revise the MC assignment guidelines to let full MVNOs be issued mobile network codes. We respectfully submit that the case is even clearer here. You are grappling with a very heated debate in this hearing about whether and how to mandate wholesale unbundling of access facilities for MVNOs. 
we don't have a dog in that fight. But we can make it much, a much better fight, all with one regulatory change. Lack of MNC access is blocking critical infrastructure operators from buying lots of connectivity from those who can sell it to us and from building shared radio access networks where there's nobody to sell it to us. Your move to fix that could create significant positive change within the sector. Directing the numbering committee to revise the MZ assignment guideline to enable critical infrastructure operators whose core mission includes running telecom networks to gain access to MNCs will deliver three key benefits. First, safer, more efficient, and more secure ways of moving people and freight across this country. Those ribbons of steels you heard about are becoming digital railways, but can't get there without routing their own traffic. Secondly, you will unlock shared wireless bills in rural and remote areas, enabling their deployment at a lower cost structure. And thirdly, you will fuel competitive intensity. Once we are all able to move into broadband and buy connectivity in a way that rewards the best performance and value. Il nous fera plaisir de répondre à vos questions avec nos collègues du CN une fois la présentation terminée. Merci. We will now hear the presentation of CN Railway. Please introduce yourself and your colleagues, and you have 10 minutes. Merci beaucoup, uh, Madame la Secrétaire. Um, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madame Vice Chair, distinguished commissioners, uh, commission staff, ladies and gentlemen, in attendance at this hearing. Uh, je m'appelle Antonio Aranibar. Je suis architecte de solutions senior en technologie d'opération au sein du Canadien national. Uh, je suis accompagné aujourd'hui par Monsieur Tim Polax au bout de la table, um, notre directeur principal du programme uh, ETC, Enhanced Train Control, par son acronyme en anglais, et par Catalin Mew, directeur principal de mise en opération de technologie. First and foremost, Canadian National Railway would like to express its appreciation for the opportunity to address the Commission in this joint panel attendance with our Railway Association of Canada representatives. CN has actively contributed to the RAC's May 15, 2019 submission in response to CRTC's consultation 2019-57 at the onset of the review of mobile wireless services proceeding in Canada. The hearing is an opportunity to share our industry position it is our view that Canada may obtain multifaceted and multilateral benefits if the Commission were to consider a minor enhancement to the Canadian IMC Identity Assignment Guideline that would allow the allocation of a mobile network code to critical infrastructure operators, CIOs. We believe that such regulatory amendment would enable transformational public-private partnerships in the mobile wireless communication sector. Access to a mobile network code for data routing routing and network identification would allow critical infrastructures such as rail and utilities to operate key components of mobile communications networks in line with our operational requirements by leveraging incumbent mobile operator networks and or private public initiatives such as the upcoming Public Safety Broadband Network of Canada. A key innovative highlight of the proposal is that it could also enable MNOs and MVNOs to serve rural and remote communities of Canada currently deprived of reliable and or affordable mobile broadband wireless access, and hence excluded of the social and economic benefits that the technology uh, brings. It is important to note that the vision we are sharing hereby is non-committal and would have to be subject to a thorough review of its economic sense and viability for all stakeholders if the regulatory hurdles were to be removed. Before we elaborate on the proposal, we would like to share with the Commission some key principles of railway operations to outline the justification of our request. Mr. Brazo has clearly articulated the significance of the railway industry as an economic engine of Canada. As such, and as a critical infrastructure operator, rail operations are closely linked to concepts of great importance to Canada's social and economic sustainable development. Government of Canada defines critical infrastructure as, quote, processes, systems, facilities, technologies, networks, assets, and services essential to the health, safety, security, or economic well-being of Canadians and the effective function of government, unquote. 
Our government also highlights the importance of reliable critical infrastructure by stating that, quote, disruption of critical infrastructure operations can result in significantly adverse economic effects and harm to public, unquote. Canadian National Railway upholds these principles. Hence, our operations rely on the same pillars, safety and reliability. Railway technological advancements are integrated into our operations only after exhaustive assessment and verification of their compliance with our most stringent safety requirements for both the communities we serve and our personnel. These systems need to be also reliable and not disruptive to the continuity of our rail operations. Proof of our commitment to safety and reliability is our sustained investment in safety-enhancing uh, technological systems, as well as continuous improvements and innovations to our rail operations. CN has over 800 wayside field devices in Canada that monitor train and locomotive health, including hot wheel detection, wheel impact, and load detectors, cutting-edge rail car imaging portal systems, a new and highly specialized track inspection rail cars capable of inspecting rail condition and track components. These data and information are essential to railway operations. These systems are strategically located and integrated as a network within CN's transportation, mechanical, and engineering functions at CN. As these systems evolve, CN is a leader in safety, innovation, and the common thread is managing telecommunications and data effectively as a digital railway. Reliable communications across our vast territory through mountain ranges, prairies, and lakes, both in urban and rural settings, are hands of the essence. CN has deployed one of the largest privately owned fiber optic networks in Canada, spanning over more than 9,500 kilometers running aside our tracks. We operate narrowband radios in dedicated VHF and UHF spectrum, 160 megahertz, 450 megahertz, 800 megahertz, and 900 megahertz. Licensed to the REC for a variety of mission critical railway operations. Narrowband wireless technology is however becoming a bottleneck. New mission critical applications demand increased wireless data communications capability that only broadband wireless can deliver. Data capability demand for advanced systems such as distributed power, diagnostics, intralocomotive, conscious communications, new methods of train control, and their optimization is increasingly evolving. On the other hand, commercial wireless broadband networks are designed, operated, and maintained with a primary focus on the consumer electronics market, that is, smartphones and tablets. Through no fault of its own, the nature of MNO's business model does not require mission critical levels of network hardening, reliability, availability, and ubiquitous rural coverage. Commercial mobile network offerings are driven mostly by service level objectives and do not commit to stringent service level agreement. MNO's network's coverage is naturally driven by market forces and subscriber population density, which is not necessarily aligned to critical infrastructure presence in remote regions. The rail industry requires a higher ubiquitous wireless reliability performance standard for the continuity of its operations. These are all factors that have curbed the adoption of broadband wireless technologies in the critical infrastructure domain and limited their utilization to bulk non-mission critical data transfers or as best effort backup mechanisms to private narrowband communication dedicated networks. A mobile network code for critical infrastructure operators sectors such as rail transportation would enable CIOs to route their mission critical data to their own high availability core networks while also enabling a host of collaboration and partnership opportunities. The proposal is hinged on two complementary network models, namely critical infrastructure operated shared radio access network, CIO shared RAN, and private virtual network operator PVNO. Shared RAN is a standard global practice supported by all major equipment manufacturers and widely used by mobile network operators in Canada and abroad for radio network sharing. In the proposed scenario, critical infrastructure would be able to install, operate, and maintain a shared radio access network over their infrastructure footprint while also providing MNOs, MVNOs, and or potentially public safety with radio access to remote communities. Conversely, in urban settings, the aforementioned highly available critical infrastructure operator core networks can connect to two or more overlapping MNO radio access networks, obtaining enhanced reliability through radio network redundancy. This is the network model referred to as PVNO. The allocation of an MNC to critical infrastructure operators would entail multiple benefits for Canadian and all stakeholders, namely 
reduction of the digital divide in underserved rural and remote areas surrounding critical infrastructure footprint. Critical infrastructure operators access to a high level of core and radio access network control. MNOs and MVNOs opportunity to enhance their subscriber base into remote communities over shared critical infrastructure operator radio access networks. Potential for public safety broadband network, PSBN, extended reach into rural and remote communities. In concluding this address, we would like to state that the decisive collaboration between government, critical infrastructure industries, and mobile network operators proposed herein has the potential to situate Canada in a global leadership position concerning the adoption of wireless cellular technologies in support to safe and reliable critical infrastructure applications while delivering outstanding social and economic benefits in the form of wireless broadband inclusion to the communities that we jointly serve. Thank you so much for your attention today. Uh, we look forward to answering any questions that the Commission may have uh, about either of our two presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Let me start. Um, I guess at the most general level what you're saying is that your proposal, and I think it's similar, um, although there are differences, what the um, electric distribution industry is raising and even um, some um, other public safety and law enforcement um, players are saying is that it's possible that some of these changes could improve um, not only operational efficiency, as you said, just said for the railway industry, um, but also fulfill other broader public safety um, objectives. So can you unpack that a little bit for me in terms of um, there are obviously public safety measures developed, um, both on the carrier side for the transportation industry. Um, can you unpack just how this would um, the changes that you propose um, would, in fact, uh, increase public safety and f support the national security strategy and action plan, which you quoted in your uh, submissions to us. Um, to let's start there. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, répondre en français ou en anglais? Okay, merci. Um, we are a little bit different from the uh, public safety community in the fact that what we are looking at is really full control over our network. Um, we are looking for um, uh, MNC to be able to operate our own core, uh, so we are uh, master of our own destiny when it comes to routing communications. Uh, we are not looking at a shared uh, network with the public safety. We are very well aware of band 14 availability. Uh, we are very well aware of the work of the TINCO group, the Temporary National Coordination, Coordination Office of the Public Safety Broadband Network. Uh, but uh, really, we are not looking to be a PSBN user. We are really looking at uh, being a if we ever partner with the PSBN, we will be a co-operator, uh, co, uh, uh, but we are, uh, again, differentiating ourselves from the public safety community uh, because we really need that core network to be part of our operation. And uh, we will, uh, and we do not uh, intend to uh, depend on somebody else running a core network that we will invest in. And how does it differ from other sectors, um, industry players who might too like to operate their own networks for their own reasons, separate from the commercially available services? Um, what, why, why can't the existing wireless players, wireless and broadband players, um, fulfill your needs in a commercially viable way? Okay. Um, that's a good question, actually. Um, trains are running on, uh, they, they're not depending fully on communications right now. 
okay? So uh, even if there is a shortage of communications, and right, right now we're talking about bra uh, narrowband communications, a uh, train will keep running, and if there's a really, uh, if, if there's a real shortage in communication, for example, I don't know, uh, two or more towers uh, go down in a, in a train route and there's no way to communicate with the locomotive, the train will stop, okay? What we are uh, fearing here, uh, and we, not only we, are we fearing, but uh, we are, it's safety first in our industry, and whenever there would be a cut in communications, uh, right now it's narrowband, but if we go broadband, uh, whenever they, they, there's a cut in communication, the train will stop. And stopping a train is a long, it's a short process. Okay, trains don't stop on a dime, of course, but restarting a train is a long process. So we don't want that to happen all the time uh, because we cannot control uh, all the variables of a uh, network, such as you know maintenance time or uh, RAN cutoffs and stuff like that. So um, this is where uh, I think we differentiate from the other uh, players, is that you know, we need to keep our train running, and if there is a shutdown of communications between uh, the train and the, uh, the, the, the central, uh, train will stop, and it's, uh, it's a pain to restart the train. Thank you. If, if I may add, if, if, if you allow me. Please, go ahead. Me, Commissioner. Um, Microphone. Yeah. It's on. So um, if I may add to, 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 to what Daniel just uh, alluded to, um, it, uh, personally, I, I bring a couple of decades of background in the wireless cellular industry. Um, it's, uh, and again, as I mentioned during my presentation, it's not through fault of their own that industry is catering for a different set of users as their bulk uh, uh, user subscriber base. Uh, these days currently, we do have uh, in our rate operations uh, some utilization of cellular connectivity, but it's very unlikely that we would put all our eggs on that one basket in the sense that um, the wireless uh, cellular industry is characterized for not having service level agreements that they are willing to uh, undersign or to, to, to put forward in, in, in contractual terms. Uh, they are mostly driven by service level objectives, which is a yearning of performance. And one thing to remember, just to make an anecdotal uh, analogy, in our workspace, if we were to produce, uh, do some maintenance or some configuration work on radio equipment that is linked to mission critical applications, such as train safety and so on and so forth, um, we have full uh, situational awareness of where our trains are at the moment, and we would not conduct such maintenance till that train has stopped or has already passed or is not in, in service. Um, the, the, the wireless cellular industry, uh, as we used to kind of uh, kid around back in the days as a, as a young engineer, right? Uh, midnight to 5 a.m. maintenance window period is a pretty hectic period where they are allowed to do a lot of things while most subscribers are sleeping and they will not feel the impact of a relatively uh, not as performing or reliable service, which is good enough for people who are having glitches of 30 seconds of a Netflix show, which is going to be buffered anyways, but uh, a train might stop. And again, right, uh, there goes our reputation as a, as a supply chain and, and as economic engine of Canada. So I'm going to follow up, but I think I'll follow up on those two themes maybe separately. So in the first response, if I can paraphrase, what you're saying is that you know, for everyday use, so to speak, the system is fine, but you're more concerned about emergency or exceptional, extraordinary um, circumstances. But if a public safety version of an MVNO is relying still on the underlying carriers who would provide you with the service in any event, 
um, how is how, how, how is it more secure? How is it uh, how is it different fundamentally underneath? If towers go down, towers go down, uh, and and it wouldn't be available to the wireless provider uh, or you. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question, um, and that's. Uh, one of the main reasons why we need to operate our own core. Uh, we need to have access to at least two radio access network uh, in, in any given areas. Right now, with centralized train control, which is good old dispatch with voice communications, uh, we have double or triple redundancy for communications all across our network. Um, we will need something like that um, when we go, we will need something like that when we go broadband. And having our own core network would allow us to, in urban areas where there are service providers with spectrum, uh, would allow us to connect to the RANs of two or more providers. So if one tower goes down, we would still rely on the RAN of the other service provider. But isn't that the case for the industry today, that they in turn rely on one another? If there is a major outage on one system, I assume from a public safety and service continuity perspective, that they support each other so that there would be service. Uh, it is, but if a radio access network, if a RAN, if the, the, the last mile link goes down, uh, there will be a uh, there will be a uh, shortage in communications, which is not an, uh, it's not acceptable for us. Um, maybe uh, yeah, because the the train will stop, and uh, maybe uh, Antonio can yeah. can go a little bit further on that sure. uh, with respect to uh, shared rants. Sure, uh, I can further elaborate on that. Um, I mean, it's worth remembering that the Public Safety Broadband Network of Canada is still a work in progress. So the only real-life example we, I guess we can refer to is what happens in the United States, FirstNet, which is the first responders network. I understand Bell in Canada has some offerings. They have been um, trying to introduce quality of service content, uh, content into their uh, offering for, to cater for first responders and potentially to position themselves towards being operators of the Public Safety Broadband Network of Canada. Uh, but what it's worth remembering is um, that in, in FirstNet, which is operated in a wholesale fashion by AT&T Wireless in the United States, just to what uh, Daniel was saying, the last mile access, it's risk management. They're playing with the statistics, right? The last mile access has uh, coverage redundancy for multiple towers. They are solely depending on that layer of one operator. But then if one tower goes down, there will be some marginal coverage provided by another tower. The core network, conversely, which is a hub which centralizes all these radio access network, which is a field area network uh, coverage, which is centralized in the back office systems of, say, AT&T, that one has to be built at uh, the highest level of availability reliability. And it's no surprise that AT&T built a separate core just to cater for public safety, not the regular core because maintenance window, once again, on that commercial subscriber uh, workspace, it's a best effort network. So the same thing would have to happen in Canada once we built a PSBN. And all those are driven by this technical artifact known as a mobile network code. We are pretty much asking for our own ability to access to a mobile network code as critical infrastructure operators of Canada to be able to build the same resiliency that the public safety community could build by owning a, a separate core network. And what about concerns, for example, about cybersecurity networks? Uh, operators have obligations, responsibilities with respect to um, cybersecurity. It's an increasingly complex area. Um, I guess in the most simple sense, the more devices attached to the network, and this obviously will be a challenge in the future in 5G, um, but also the more that things are not in their direct control, uh, I'm assuming that they will have uh, increased concerns about cybersecurity. Well, you know, um, we, um, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, we belong in this market. We've been around for a while. Uh, we are well aware of all the threats that 
could come out uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, communication and especially mission critical communications. And uh, I believe uh, that we have standards that are uh, way up there. Uh, we do have uh, policies uh, in, in terms of cybersecurity within our main members, our, uh, our class one members, uh, which are CN and CP, um, that are, uh, again, way up there, uh, equal or maybe superior to uh, what, is, what might be going on in the public safety um, uh, community or the MNO community. Uh, you have anything to add uh, to that? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, very well put. Okay, so. thank you. So you've, in your submissions you wrote that in effect you'll become an IOT player and, um, and, and push out your operational capacity in terms of uh, 5G connectivity. What, what kind of services are you envisioning a PVNO? Uh, I'm going to have to make sure I say that right. It's a, it doesn't immediately leap to mind. Um, what, what kind of services do you envision, envision, envision um, a PVNO offering? Go ahead. Do you want to turn that off? Okay. So um, uh, the PVNO is it, it's a network model which is capable of providing with uh, overlapping coverage, just like you were suggesting. Uh, through multiple mobile network operators on that last mile access we were talking about. So by owning an, a core network of our own, right, which could be enabled by having access to a mobile network code so that we can route our device uh, traffic towards that core network, and riding on top of re redundant overlapping mobile network uh, operator coverage on urban settings, and this applies only to urban settings, again, where they have a strong presence, right? We are able then to have a, an aggregate redundancy of core network plus redundant, as I was saying, best effort overlapping radio access network coverage, which would enable a host of internet, industrial internet of things use cases, which are very specific to our industry. Um, Examples of that, again, uh, if we go back to the operational technology I alluded to in my presentation, um, advanced rail car imaging systems or uh, track inspection, autonomous track inspection systems, which are extremely more efficient to detect. They go through the whole anatomy of the track and they collect enormous amounts of data, gigabytes of data, which eventually, if a health alert is noticed on that track, eventually it will issue an alert and send a host of artifacts that will get someone out of bed so that they go and look into that track uh, situation uh, right away, preemptively. So it's an enhancement to safety, it's an enhancement to efficiencies. So this is the type of industrial Internet of Things cases that we're looking at. Thank you. Could it also be used to deploy handsets to the workforce? Is that part of your vision? To provide um, handsets, mobile devices. Uh, uh of course. Um, to, uh, to the workforce. Of course, we would uh, take full advantage of, a, of an MNC and uh, migrate our network on our own core uh, in order to make, uh, to, to, uh, make this a global thing amongst uh, railway or critical infrastructure operators. Um, we would uh, eventually um, have private networks. Uh, there's a lot of talks about private 5G, uh, basically because of the nature of uh, the 5G spectrum that will be up, uh, the one that will be uh, auctioned eventually, or the one uh, that is a millimetric wave. Uh, we, we are looking at using 5G eventually to replace Wi-Fi, which is not very performant uh, in uh, urban areas. Um, so, uh, so yes, we would take advant full advantage of uh, of a mobile network code to uh, to to yeah to to migrate our uh, personal communication devices. And is your industry looking at acquiring 5G spectrum for itself? Quite uh, right now, we're not eligible for bidding in any option uh, in any auction. Sorry, um, but. 
uh, it's not out of the question, especially since um, the spectrum that we are, that we might look at is not uh, the uh, expansive spectrum uh, in urban areas. Uh, these are very much uh, out of reach for our industry because you know the, the, the cost per pop is uh, is uh, is extremely high, and we're we don't work on a per pop uh, <laughs> uh, industry. Uh, but uh, it's it's not out of the question. Uh, we actually looked at that uh, a few years ago. Uh, but uh, we decided not to because we were not eligible. We were not registered with you guys as a uh, facility-based service uh, provider. But I assume you've raised the issue with ISED in the past or currently with respect to possible changes to auction rules and, uh, and eligibility? Yeah, we, we, we talk with IZ on a regular basis. We actually submitted some comments when uh, there was uh, the consultation on 600 megahertz spectrum. We mm -hmm. uh, proposed that uh, a block of 5 plus 5 megahertz be assigned to critical infrastructure operators. Uh, that was not, uh, obviously, that was not uh, approved by IZ. But uh, it, it, it's, a sto it's the story of... Uh, spectrum management at the REC uh, for the last uh, 20 years that we, uh, we meet regularly with IZ. We're trying to find solutions to uh, migrate to a broadband, and uh, this is actually one of the solutions. That, that's the latest solution that we, uh, we, we thought about. Thanks. So I assume you've had a chance to look at um, the record of this proceeding and, and hopefully had a chance to look at some of the other um, proposals that have been put forward by parties to the proceeding. If the Commission were to mandate full MVNO access, would that not be sufficient to meet your needs? As uh, Mark mentioned in this uh, part of their presentation, we don't have a, a, a dog in that fight. Um, we would rather not get into that debate that is left to uh, that, that debate is amongst uh, service providers. We are users, and um, we are uh, certainly not uh, counting on any MVNO uh, decision by the CRTC to uh, meet our needs. Uh, we are all about getting an MNC and managing our own core, and anything that would uh, that would delegate some of our uh, railway network management uh, is, uh, is simply uh, not, uh, it's, it's off the table for now. So um, we, again, we, we don't have, we are users, we're not service providers. You have something to add, Antonio? Yeah, uh, I may add to what uh, Daniel just alluded to. Um, the, 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 and I agree that we are not a uh, stakeholder on that. Uh, we understand oh, what's at stake. We're following closely the process, but we don't take any sides. Um, nevertheless, having said that, to address more directly, like if you were to mandate MVNO access and whether that would uh, facilitate pave the road, not really, right? An MVNO provider is entitled by the EMC allocation guideline to, uh, to obtain a mobile network code as a non-facility-based operator because they need that precisely to be able to route their traffic which is the same uh, conundrum we are on, right? Um, the, having said that, uh, we still are not, we don't want to go into the network operator business. We are, don't want to deal with subscribers. If anything, we want to be enablers. And also to bring back perspective to what I mentioned during my presentation, there is a second component other, other than the PVNO, which is this CIO shared grant we have been alluding to, which is our value proposition of potentially and I emphasize potentially, considering building a um, radio access network, shared radio access network with multiple stakeholders that could uh, use our fiber, we could use our right-of-way presence and serve the social and economic purpose of catering for urban and, uh, sorry, for rural and remote communities as well. And depending on who are the players, that's when in my presentation I, did an, uh, I made a reference to public safety. If they were to entertain us as one of their partners, and that's one of the multiple possibilities, uh, definitely we would be looking forward to 
also bringing, not only helping to bridge the core networks from mobile network operators, MVNOs if they ever get mandated, to the remote communities, but potentially also public safety. This is all uh, a vision we are sharing with you today. And this vision can be materialized, the twofold vision, by revising the IMSI allocation guideline and, and paving the road for a mobile network code access to, to critical infrastructure operators as economic engines of Canada. So, go ahead. If I, if I can just add, um, in very simple terms, just from a regulatory standpoint, you know, uh, we're talking in this hearing about full, v full MVNOs. After in 2015, the Commission changed those MZ assignment guidelines to provide for full MVNOs to be able to route traffic. Today, we have critical infrastructure operators. Obviously, we're not talking about public safety operators. They're a different kind of user. But we're talking about critical infrastructure operators who would like to not only be able to route their own traffic, uh, who require the same kind of change that full MVNOs uh, obtained in 2015, which really set the table for them being able to hopefully negotiate their MVNO business that apparently hasn't come to fruition. Um, but on the, uh, you know, on this side, when we're talking about these hybrid networks with PVNO elements and shared uh, RAN elements, really, in rural and remote regions, we're talking about building networks uh, where no networks are available. You can't do that if you can't route traffic to and from your network. And so really any discussion of you know, things like a tariff and all that is well beyond uh, what the critical infrastructure sector I think is looking for. Here it's really just a question of being able to route traffic. Everything else is, is a question of building as a question of negotiation. Thank you. You just mentioned the hybrid approach. Um, can you compare your hybrid approach to, for example, what's being proposed by Koshiko in its model? Um, yeah, we, we had an interesting discussion just uh, yesterday about that. Uh, Kojiko is uh, hybrid in the sense that they want to leverage some of their uh, wireline infrastructures with wireless. Um, our approach might be called hybrid also, but we are more talking about going virtual on existing networks in urban areas where there is no spectrum available uh, because uh, it's all hold by um, MNOs. Um, and and, and in, in the, the other part of the hybrid model would be going on our own network uh, where uh, that, that's actually where we thrive in rural and, um, and remote areas, going on our own network using secondary market spectrum, which is available, uh, obviously, or using um, eventually band 14 spectrum. Uh, um, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm dreaming out loud here, but uh, uh, this, is, this, is the way, uh, this is the way we see, we, we see being hybrid. Uh, but of course, uh, same as Kojiko, we do have some wire, some land in infrastructure, major land infrastructure. We are actually uh, the, one of the biggest uh, owner of a private uh, fiber optic network. Uh, so uh, that could be seen as hybrid in that sense also. But what, 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 when we're talking amongst ourselves, uh, when, we, when, when we think hybrid, it's really you know, shared RAN that we operate and where there is no spectrum, where we cannot build a RAN, we go virtual on existing RANs uh, more than two again for redundancy and uh, for uh, safety. Thank you. Um, I, if, if I may, uh, only to maybe for yes. further clarification, and I, I agree with everything that Daniel had just said, it's just to, to make it simpler, I think they're using the term hybrid in a different context. It's an unfortunate coincidence, right? So when we say hybrid, it's, it's a twofold propo proposal, PVNO Understood. plus shared RAN, versus the hybrid that they are talking about is a different type of setup. I understand. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you were um, listening or in attendance when uh, representatives from Bell were here um, the other day. Uh, Vice Chair Leisner had a discussion uh, with them um, about um, some of these requests. And I'm just looking at the responses. 
Um, we asked them basically if they'd had some discussions or negotiations with um, industry players such as yourselves. And I think his description was uh, they wouldn't call them negotiations, but some discussions. Um, and that's in part because they've suggested that uh, in part on the customer side, there's not necessarily complete alignment between individual customers um, and um, the associations. That may or may not be true in your case. You can speak to that. Um, but generally speaking, their view is simply it's premature. Um, that we're not ready um, at this point. There's a, a wide range of demands being made. Um, and they feel, in their words, that they can respond in a commercial sense um, to your needs. So I want to give you the opportunity to respond to, um, to those. Maybe starting with, have you had negotiations um, with the MNOs? Uh, and propose, for example, win-win solutions, joint builds, and so on. I, I did listen to Bell's presentation, which was very interesting. Um, that did uh, get my attention when they mentioned uh, that um, some of the uh, industry players were not totally aligned with uh, their associations. And I can tell you today that it's absolutely not the case with the Railway Association. We are totally aligned with our members. Uh, we actually have one uh, co-presenting with us today. Um, and uh, there are always negotiations. Again, we are using MNOs uh, quite extensively. We're very good clients of MNOs right now. Uh, but we are using their network for non-mission critical operation, OK? It's, um, and, and they're uh, unvaluable. I mean, we need them, okay? But this is different. When we're talking about integrating wideband to our uh, mission critical operations, uh, no MNO can provide us with a solution because what we need is to, again, manage our own core, manage our own routing, and uh, it's, um, it's in, 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 in this world, we will, of course, need to work with the MNOs, but we will need to negotiate uh, equal to equal with them, and uh, that can only be done if we get our MNC. I, I don't want to belabor this, but I'm, I'm guessing that the carriers must have some fairly specialized services available for national defense purposes for others, you, you really don't see a possibility that they can develop a commercial service that will meet your needs? Nope. Uh, based on experience, we're, we're not basing this on, on uh, studies or technical analysis. Based on experience, uh, based on the multiple report we get from our um, broadband equipment uh, that, that report uh, any failure in a given day to, uh, to a central computer. Uh, based on that, uh, we are 100% uh, sure that the service that can be provided by uh, MNO right now, and it's not their fault, but because they need to uh, you know, they need to provide service not only to critical infrastructure operators, but they need to provide service to everybody else. Uh, we, uh, we, we know for a fact that uh, it's not sufficient enough for our mission critical operation. And again, they're valuable partners in our operation, but there is this niche uh, service that they cannot uh, provide us with in its uh, mission critical um, mission critical applications. Um, Antonio probably has some first hand uh, anecdotes or uh, experience on that. Antonio. Well, uh, once again, right. I guess we are in a better place position as an industry to know what kind of operational technology we're willing to put in the hands of systems, understanding the type of service that we are expecting to get. 
if they are telling us we are giving you best effort communications, it's for sure that I'm not going to put the reliability of our precision schedule railroading in the hands of a best effort communication system. Again, safety will never be compromised, we'll stop the trains, but trains that stop all the time are very inefficient. Right. Um, having said that, and um, I would like to just refer you to a study that was put together that's uh, somewhat uh, old, but at the same time still relevant till this day. Um, a report from an independent consultant to the European Union, 188 pages report, in which they concluded that commercial cellular services could be potentially uh, suitable for uh, mission critical applications, and they looked at it through three angles, um, rail, electrical, I think it was utilities in general, and public safety, which has a different naming in Europe, uh, uh, public disaster relief or something along those lines. And um, the conclusion is that it would be viable provided that two pages of uh, um, regulation were to be enforced on commercial cellular providers before we can put very delicate matters in the hands of, of, of their service. So that's, when, that's a public report that is available out there and it's an interesting report to look at. I'm not sure if it is currently on the record. If it isn't, would you undertake to put the report on the record of this proceeding? I surely would not have a problem with that. But uh, again, uh, in general, uh, I'm, I'm going to fall back to our legal counsel here if we want to file that uh, in confidentiality terms. Oh. We would be happy to file that as an undertaking. Thank you, counsel. Um, I'll come back to some of the, a few more questions about the actual MVNO structure in a second, but before I do, what about the concerns that's being raised um, by some parties about a future exhaustion of mobile network codes? Um, do you have a view as to whether the concerns uh, are valid? Um, you know, how, how are we going to limit, is it going to be individual members, is it codes for the association? How, how do you envisage that going and how do you address the concerns about exhaust? Uh, first of all, um, we are um, we're well aware that this is a very, uh, it's a limited resource. Uh, that's why our original submission uh, was for uh, MNC to critical infrastructure operators. Um, we uh, are also well aware that um, this is not uh, something to be given uh, broadly, but um, we think we have a good business case for, for getting one. And um, it's, uh, to, be, to, to be frank with you, we had many discussions because it's, it's it's seen as a, uh, uh, Antonio called it the Saint Graal of, of, of communication when you, when you get your hands on one. And uh, we, we respect that very much. Uh, but uh, we've seen some local, uh, very, 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 very local providers with three MNCs. So there might be, um, there might be some, uh, you know, some, some, some cleanup to do uh, in, in terms of uh, having uh, those MNC handled like that. Um, but uh, I think one MNC for critical infrastructure in Canada is not too much. So to just us. to be clear, you've said one a couple of times now. You're, you are proposing that it be one. Well, we would we would like ten. Uh, we would like <laughs> <laughs> we'd like we'd like a two. Uh, there are a lots two of digits, things I would uh, like. Code. I'm just trying to understand what is your request. Yeah, uh, our original request. Okay, uh, Ram, want to yeah. step? Yeah, I mean, look. At the end of the day, this is exactly why the CSCN exists. Um, certainly, in 2015, the Commission wrote two paragraphs and said, CSCN figured out what's the right efficient way to use this limited resource given the routing needs, given the benefits of the Canadian telecommunications system and everything else. And you know, while we can try and sort of second guess their work here and really figure out the proper way of managing these codes, I know that at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're a forum which includes all the experts and has has the ability to deal with it. I would note, by the way, that the current work of, of the CSCN in this area is going back to the ITU to ask for another 
uh, block of MNCs precisely because they've recognized that both uh, full MVNOs and also private LTE operators are likely to use MNCs in the future. So this is certainly not uh, something that nobody sees coming. But that said, they really are the right place, I think, to, to work out these sort of detailed questions. Thank you for the response. Going back to, the, to your model for a second. So you have some facilities um, you'll continue to build out to a certain extent, but you've explained that in all likelihood your members won't bid on spectrum. Um, can you talk a little more in terms of who will actually be operating this RAN? I'm, I'm still having a little trouble understanding exactly how this is operationalized. Who, who would run the RAN? Who would be responsible um, for okay. fulfilling any and all obligations that yeah. might be imposed? Yeah, we, we look at all options. Uh, obviously, uh, the less MNC we get, the more complicated it gets. Uh, so, um, for example, if we get what MNC for all critical infrastructure operators, uh, it would obviously be a, uh, a new entity that would need to be formed, that would need to uh, not only uh, operate the RANs, but also operate the core, uh, manage all the, uh, the routing of, of, a, uh, of the MNC of a eventual critical infrastructure operators network. Um, we've already talked with uh, the Canadian Electricity Association quite extensively. Uh, you might be aware of that. Uh, we had uh, not only talks, but we did, held, we did hold a, uh, a seminar last year on, on broadband access for critical infrastructure operators. And um, again, it would be uh, the, the way we see it, it would be a joint venture. It would, we would need to create a, a new entity. Uh, but again, we are, um, we, we, we belong in the telecom market. Again, we, are, we have extensive experience and that's not something that we are afraid of. Creating a new entity, manage a network core, uh, manage RANs, uh, this is something that uh, we can do as an association uh, we already manage uh, quite a big chunk of spectrum uh, on behalf of two competitors, CN and CP. Uh, we, the, the Railway Association of Canada actually hold a spectrum license that uh, includes all the frequencies used by all of our members, which are all competitors in the market. Uh, so uh, we have experience on that, and we also have experience uh, managing uh, more um, day-to-day uh, -day core operation of a radio network. So this is something that uh, we uh, already thought of. Uh, of course, it gets less complex if we have more than one MNC, if we have one MNC per sector, for example, uh, one for rail, one for uh, electricity or utilities, and it gets even less complex if we have one MNC for each uh, railway that needs to operate uh, broadband, uh, because then we can delegate all the core operations to uh, our members. But uh, should it be a decision, should it be uh, the decision of the commission to uh, assign one MNC to critical infrastructure operators? I mean, we're in. We're ready to take the lead, and uh, we're ready to uh, enter into negotiations with any critical infrastructure operators that might be interested in, in joining our uh, coalition. A couple of other quick questions before I change subjects a bit. I, I'm still struggling a little to understand wh why. I know you don't want to be in the, if you will, in a in a consumer business. But why couldn't the RAC simply create an MVNO and go get access? Uh, so, so the the difference between um, 
and, and our understanding is that uh, mobile network operators, mobile virtual network operators, their definition is such that they are there to serve uh, end users, part of the general public, right? So the distinction between an MVNO and a PVNO is because it's a private entity, which is using and creating network components, this core network I've been talking about all along, that is only used to deliver with the highest cybersecurity levels uh, directly data routed through mobile uh, network operators, radio access networks, onto that common consolidated core network just for private uses of the industry. So by CRTC's own definition, an MVNO uh, eligibility does not apply to us. Um, uh, along the same lines, when you were asking about why don't we apply for a spectrum, same, in the same, uh, like spectrum we understand is a very scarce resource, very valuable, and, and needs to serve a higher purpose, right? So that's why it is broadband, we're talking broadband spectrum here, right? That, that's why it's only uh, made available to entities such as MNOs, MVNOs, which will be, or MNOs, sorry, who would be serving the general population. Would, in your view, would the PVNO have to take on all the um, other requirements that the commission typically applies with respect to E911 or, um, you know, other services meant to, for, for public safety purposes or to protect the public? Um, precisely, the model is uh, such that the PVNO has no uh, inference in, in that area. Like, we leave the space of 911, E911 on the PVNO model. On the shared brand model, which is where we would be potentially be operating a last mile access, then definitely we would have to have the same obligations as shared brand providers that are a regular but, network. But, e but even under the PVNO, you mentioned earlier, handsets, for example, would be used. Would, the, would your employees limit their use of handsets only to strictly work functions? I, I, Our, I, I'm seeing a concern about you know people with phones that are not. Um, able to obtain warnings and the like. And, and you're absolutely right, right? So at this point, I mean, we are at the baby steps of this whole vision. Handhelds would be a phase two, but the handhelds and those would be operational handheld technology for operational purposes. We're not trying to put the, 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 the services of, um, you know, their smartphones and whatnot, because again, we're very aware of the scarcity of all these resources that potentially the government would be granting to us. Thank you. Um, maybe a last area. You may have also heard um, a bit of that discussion with Bell. Commissioner Leisner also asked about eSIMs. Um, and basically the answer was, yes, <laughs> they're coming. Um, you've uh, emphasized the importance of that uh, in your submissions to us. Again, if the carriers were to have that technology commercially deployed, um, would that assist in their ability, uh, would that lessen your concerns about a reliance on commercial services? Let me put it that way. Uh, I believe uh, Bark's uh, opening remarks mentioned eSIMs. Uh, this, uh, this is not a solution for us, again. Uh, we're not looking at switching service provider on a dime here. We're looking at uh, operating our own core and being the, uh, uh, you know, being the master of our own routing uh, system. So uh, even though eSIMs might be uh, a solution for some of uh, critical infrastructure operators, uh, it's um, it, it's it's not possible for us because because we need a shared RAN uh, in areas where uh, there are no providers. So uh, eSIM is totally uh, unusable in 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 most of the areas where we where we operate. Uh, I heard the I heard the number yesterday: thirty five percent of our uh, route is not covered by actual MNOs right now. So uh, eSIMS is, uh, we, we looked at it and uh, we simply uh, put it uh, off the table, even though it's an interesting technology. Thank you. I think my last question, 
I just want to be clear. Is your model dependent on the ability to connect to multiple RANs? Sure. Uh, be, um, I mean, just so I, I to fully I understand the, 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 the question, so PVNO is precisely about that. Is unifying a virtual, like virtualizing basically a couple of mobile network operated radio access networks and making it work as a sole entity aggregated at the core network level by a facility operated by critical infrastructure. So PVNO does that precisely, what we just alluded to. So the commission a future regulatory framework that would be consistent with your objective would require that the commission um, liberalize uh, access, MVNO access or PVNO access on all carriers everywhere. Is that correct? Uh, if it were to be mandated, um, that is, uh, I would say, a different discussion. Um, the, the ability to have uh, access, because the, the part of the mandate comes along with wholesale services, and that's not something we're after. Uh, we're after network hardening, after robustness, and not after uh, you know, uh, cheaper rates, basically, right? Definitely, it would be beneficial, and it would foster whatever business model we would have. Um, but definitely that's not the primary concern. Um, okay, thank you. And just, to, and just, just to be completely clear, the only regulatory ask is to direct the, uh, the, the, the Canadian Steering Committee on Numbering to revise the MC assignment guideline. Everything else is doable in the marketplace. Thank you. Members, questions? Commissioner Leisner. Good morning. Um, so if um, those changes were to be made uh, such that you would be able to access those MNCs, do you have a, a rollout plan, a time frame in terms of your vision? Well, uh, of course, it's uh, the, 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 the first thing that comes to mind is replacing um, uh, replacing Wi-Fi in, in yards, in rail yards, okay? So uh, we have lots of promises from 5G uh, operation uh, that, uh, that would suit our uh, needs for that. Uh, but in terms of a, a complete rollout of um, PVNO, that could obviously be done quite quickly. Uh, we'd need to enter into negotiations with uh, providers, uh, mainly in urban areas. Uh, but for a RAN rollout, um, we will need to uh, study a little bit more, uh, make a business case for our, um, for our uh, executive, the, the bean counters up there. And um, it's... Uh, we, we, we cannot, uh, I, I cannot commit as a member of the Railway Association right now to a rollout plan uh, that would need to be uh, discussed with, uh, uh, I believe, individual railways um, which are uh, more, uh, which hold the, uh, you know, they have the wallet. But uh, maybe Antonio will have something to add to this. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. At, at this point, I think it's a very early stage, right? We are coming here before you precisely asking for the removal of this regulatory hurdle, given the fact that this, as, as uh, Daniel alluded to, it is the holy grail to enable even to dream about this vision. Once we have that out of the way, then we can start sitting around the table with potential partners, whether MNOs, MVNOs, if they ever get mandated and so on, um, share brand players, say MNOs that would be willing to subordinate some of their spectrum to us, or potentially public safety, who are also listening to uh, this potential. But it's all potential at this point, which is still uh, kind of still captive because of this regulatory barrier of the lack of access to an MNC. And if um, you weren't successful in getting that access, what would be the impact on you? Where do you see the hurdles? Well, we would be able to go wide bet. I mean, we, we looked at a lot of options over the last 20 years. 
Uh, we've petitioned IZ, as I mentioned earlier, to get access to 600 megahertz spectrum. Uh, we did petitionize it again to have some power limits in the various uh, ITS, intelligent transportation system, band, uh, raise the power limits to, to suit uh, rail operations uh, because those, those limits are more suited for, uh, for, for, for uh, car operations. Um, so, so we did explore a lot of uh, avenues. We even looked at a band that is currently assigned to the uh, electrical utilities in the 1.7 megahertz band. Uh, it's a simplex band. Uh, we looked at uh, a thing called um, uh, TDMA LTE, which is not suitable for us uh, because the, the nature of TDMA uh, implies some delays in communications. Uh, so uh, that would be, that, that's, that's kind of a deal breaker for us. Uh, we, will, uh, we will keep on using uh, broadband, obviously, because we live in a broadband world, but we will not use broadband for mission critical operations. Thank you. Commissioner, oh, thank you. No. Council, any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to appear and for your submissions and fulsome responses. Uh, we'll break for lunch, um, returning at one one thirty. <laughs>